Well, good morning, church. It's good to be here with you today, and we always are grateful for the times we can come and be with you folks down here in Frederick at uh, Victory Baptist, and we have, uh, yeah, we've been coming here a long time, so you all have been faithful to support us. It's hard to believe we've been in South Africa for um, over 13 years now, and God is, God is good, and God is faithful. I, that gray hair, you know, on your pastor, I'm glad I don't have any of that, but uh, <laughs> somebody's getting older, but it's not me, right? So <laughs> that's how we like to, that's what we like to tell ourselves anyway, but it's, it's good to be here this morning. I do wish I could have brought the rest of my family. They all wanted to come and they send their, their greetings to you, but uh, the Lord saw fit uh, that it would be otherwise today. I'm just glad that I could come. And so I had your pastor nervous yesterday. I told him I wasn't sure, but uh, praise the Lord, I woke up feeling fine this morning and we made the journey down. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles uh, to the Gospel of Matthew this morning. We'll be there in Matthew chapter 28 as we think about missions this morning and particularly the great commission that Christ has given to his churches the responsibility to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. We, uh, we, take, we take the word of God literally this morning, amen? We take the words and the commandments of Christ to be uh, both literal and to be serious, that we ought to take these things soberly and we ought to really ask a, a personal question today, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Because we do, we do believe this morning that the words of God are, are not uh, idle chit-chat, they're not just suggestions uh, or things that we might gather together on Sundays and, and theorize about, but we do believe that God has given us His Word with the intent that as His children, we would take it seriously and ask the Lord for the strength to obey it fully. And so in Matthew 28 this morning, we began in the morning hour, those of you that were able to join us for the first hour, we began talking about this issue that we find in the New Testament of God's desire for His children to be involved in the work of making disciples. And so really we want to focus on this in a, in a twofold manner this morning. Number one, both what it means to be a disciple, to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And that is certainly the beginning. If you're not uh, yourself, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, then of course you're not going to involve your life into helping others to follow Christ. And so it really all begins with you. And I, I, I would love to ask you the question to consider this morning, who are you following? Sometimes people hear the word discipleship or following Christ and they say, oh brother, you know, this, this will be boring. You know, I'm not, I, I don't follow anybody. Can I tell you this morning, every one of you sitting in this auditorium today, you are following somebody. We, there is nobody in the world who is a self-made man or a self-made woman who says, I carve my own path. I go my own way. I don't follow any. That's a bunch of baloney. Everybody in the world is following somebody. Maybe your idol's a rock star. I hope not. Maybe your idol is a sports star. Oh, heaven help us. Let's hope not. Let's choose an idol of someone who has some godly character. Amen? If you want an idol, somebody to follow, here's a book full of examples. And of course, the greatest example that we want to talk about this morning, the one who we all ought to seek to follow after is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Now when we come to Matthew chapter 28, we understand that Jesus is speaking to His church. And He's preparing now to, to go back into heaven and to be with His Father. And He is leaving His final orders, if you will, to that first church that Jesus started Himself while he was here on the earth. And so he's, he's giving them his last words and testament, if you will. He's telling them, here is 
the responsibility, the work that I want you to look to, to fulfill. And so let's go ahead and read a familiar passage of Scripture here in Matthew 28 and verse number 16. The Bible says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. We're going to really focus on that phrase here in a little bit this morning. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. In the morning hour, we considered the verse in Mark chapter 8 where Jesus asked His disciples a very powerful question. He said, What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. I don't know if you've ever pondered a question like that this morning. I'd like to ask you a similar question though as we talk about this morning for a few moments the priority of this call, the importance of this call that Jesus gives us as followers of Christ to go and make others to be followers of Christ. Here's the question I'd like you to think about this morning. What is the greatest mark that you could leave on this world? Have you ever thought about the purpose of your life? Have you ever thought about what it is that you would like to be written, if you will, on your tombstone? Did you ever think about it? When somebody is, 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 has passed away and We bury them and we put a marker there, a tombstone to remember them by, to commemorate their life. And you you see the, the date they were born and the date that they passed away off of this earth and a little dash in between. And there's so many memories and so much in that little dash and maybe a little statement underneath, something about their life of how they lived or what they did or who they were, something that we remember them by. Could I ask you this morning, what is the greatest mark that you could leave on this world? You know, people think about this question and they think, well, if I could, if I could go to school and learn the disciplines of, of science and inventions and make some new invention that would just really benefit Mankind. We've seen a lot of new inventions. We live in the age of new inventions. I mean, I talk to my children about, you know, they, they have this thing that they think they need a cell phone. And I'm like, you guys understand that cell phones didn't even exist when I was your age. And they, they can't understand that. They think I'm old. And that's ridiculous. I'm not old. Well, the, the truth is that Cell phones, you know, my dad was always on the cutting edge of technology. And I remember as a little boy, I was probably 11. My dad, maybe some of you uh, more mature ones remember this kind of stuff. My dad got one of these boxes with a phone in it, and it plugged into the cigarette lighter in the car. And that was his mobile phone. And the thing was about this big. It looked like a small briefcase. And all it was was a phone, you know. It didn't work half the time. Never could get a signal. I don't even remember if it worked by a satellite or what it was. But, you know, it's funny. Now, you look back at that. That wasn't that long ago. That was about 30 years ago. And you see where things have come in the last 30 years. I told my children, I said, when I was 21, I drove cross-country across the United States all the way to Oak Harbor, Washington, and I had to stop every so often at a gas station, use a pay phone, because, you know, we did have a cell phone, but it was only on a local network. There was no such thing as nationwide uh, free calling. You know, that didn't exist. So we live in a time of, of new inventions, and people think, well, if I could make a new invention, maybe a scientific discovery, maybe if I could come up with a cure for disease, 
That would be a noble thing to do with your life. A cure for cancer, cure for AIDS, cure for all kinds of other diseases and maladies that afflict us. There's nothing wrong with, with, with living your life for that. Some people think that if I could live my life and build a wealthy financial empire and then even help those that are in poverty who, who are underprivileged, you know, that would, that would really be the mark that I have achieved something great with my life. Maybe I would donate a library so that those who, who, who don't have opportunity could come and find books and get an education. Maybe I could and fill in the blank. On and on we could go with, with dreams of things that we think would really leave a lasting mark on this world. Can I suggest to you this morning that all of those causes would fall, would pale and fall short in comparison to the greatest cause for which any of us could ever live our life. Jesus hinted at the greatest cause for which we should live our life when He said, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You understand what Jesus was teaching to His disciples, and when He, when he asked that question, he, he asked that question to those men who had said, we are followers of Jesus Christ. And I believe if I asked you this morning, most of you would probably raise your hand and, and, and say, I want to follow Jesus Christ. I want to know Him. I like Jesus. I love the Bible. I want to know Him more. I want to be like Him. Well, Jesus asked those first followers, that question, what will you give in exchange for your soul? And he goes on to talk about how that if you live your life for yourself, you will lose your life. You see, it's the Christian life is really a paradox in many ways. We begin to think, if I live for myself, if I just go after my dreams, if I pursue my ideals and my agenda and my career, I'll really come out on top. And God says, no, it's really not like that at all. The one who lives for himself will lose his own soul. You see, the greatest thing that we could ever live for would be to live life with the intention, number one, of following after Jesus Christ, and number two, with the intention of helping other people to follow after Jesus Christ. You know, I had somebody ask me the question a long time ago when we started out to go to South Africa to take the gospel to those people, and I, I really literally had this question. I had people ask me, well, don't you think those people in the villages over there? Don't you think that they are content with their life the way they are, apart from your God, apart from your Gospel, apart from your Jesus? I mean, they have their traditions. They have their religion. They have their ways. Don't you think you're just bothering them to go there and impose on them your religious views? Well, you know, I answered the question then, prior to going to Africa, I answered it in theory. I answered it based on what the Bible said, and I answered it based on what I believed to be true. And now after living there for 13 years and seeing the depth of the depravity and the emptiness of their life, I can answer with even all more assurance based on top of what the Bible says with what I've seen from my own experience no, I'm not bothering them. I'm not imposing anything on them. I realize now more than ever that their lives are empty and meaningless without Jesus Christ. You know, Christian friend this morning, and I'm primarily speaking to those of you who would say, Preacher, I've believed on Christ, and I would say that I'm a follower of Christ, I want to live for Him, then I want to challenge you this morning with what ought to be the priority of our life. I want to tell you this morning, there is no other pursuit 
that will impact this world beyond the grave like the testimony of one who was a sold out follower of Jesus Christ who made it his duty to bring others to the Savior and to help them to be conformed into his image. See, that is really what the, what the life of a disciple is all about. Life for those of us who follow Christ is not about me. It's not about fulfilling my dreams. It's about me helping other people to follow after Jesus Christ. Me following Christ myself and me bringing others along in this journey with me. Now I want to give you just three thoughts about the scriptural premise this morning, if you will, that compels us to be involved in this responsibility of making disciples of Jesus Christ. I believe one of the greatest areas of disobedience among Bible-believing Christians today is right here in this area that we want to talk about this morning. You see, for most of us that know Christ, we're content that we know Christ. We're satisfied with the fact that I have a Bible and I go to church and I follow Christ and we are content too often to leave it there, worried about me, myself, and I, and to just kind of tune out all of the people in the world that we encounter on a daily basis who are not following Christ, who've never heard the gospel, who've never had the opportunity. You see, as we, as we live and minister in southern Africa, I meet people all the time. They've never ever heard a meaningful presentation of the gospel. But I want to tell you this morning, you don't have to go to South Africa to find people who've never heard a meaningful presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I assure you, they live right here in Frederick, Maryland. There's people all around you. People that you work with. People that you shop with. People that live next to you in your neighborhoods that have never had anybody take the time to give them a meaningful presentation of the gospel of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. But there's three things right here in this passage this morning that really compel us to be involved in this great work that Christ our Savior has called us to do. It's a work not only of, of sharing the gospel because we realize there's more to it than just telling people what they need to do to have their sins forgiven. If you're here this morning, you've never been saved. I hope by the time the message is over, you'll have a clear understanding that there is a God in heaven who is calling you to repent of your sin and to believe on Jesus Christ. That is how to come into a right relationship with God. But I want to tell you that's just the beginning, amen? There's so much more to following Jesus Christ than just being saved. You know, the Bible actually likens it to a picture. In fact, in so many words, Jesus, when he, when he spoke to Nicodemus, he said, you must be born again. Jesus used a picture that salvation is like a new birth. In fact, he called it a new birth. And he's using an analogy to a physical birth. In other parts of the Bible, that same picture is utilized and that the analogy is drawn that, you know, when a baby is born, a baby has life. Amen? That baby comes into the world, and uh, maybe, you've, maybe you've seen a, a new baby or had the privilege of holding a new baby. Maybe your baby or somebody else's baby, and you realize at that moment, I, I'll never forget the first time that, uh, that that young man over there who's trying to, you know, overtake me now, I'll, I'll never forget when he was born. And I held him for the first time. He's the one who made me a father. And thinking just how helpless and dependent human life is. And that we all started out that way. I mean, a baby can't do anything for himself. He has life, you know. He, he knew how to cry. I'll give you that. He, he did it. He knew how to let us know that he was hungry. He knew how to let us know that he needed, you know, help. He needed something. But that's about it. You know, in the Bible, the Bible talks about that. When, when somebody's born again, they're like a newborn baby. 
And they need the milk of the Word of God to grow thereby. But you know, there's so much growth that needs to take place in a baby's life so that over time they grow up and with proper nourishment and strengthening and exercise, they, they grow up and become a responsible, mature adult and the, the process of life carries on. Spiritually speaking, it's the exact same thing. You see, there's so much more than just being born again. It's necessary as followers of Jesus Christ that the Bible says, in fact, it uses this language exactly, that you would grow up in Jesus Christ. Amen? It's God's desire for us to become spiritually mature followers of Jesus Christ. Now there's three thoughts I told you here in the passage that really compel us to be involved in this business of following Christ ourselves and of giving our life you say, well, God hasn't called me into full-time service. God didn't have to call you into full-time service for this to apply to you. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, it is the will of God that you would be involved in helping other people to follow after Jesus Christ. In fact, within the Lord's church, this is how the church is strengthened. And this is how a church grows, is as we help one another within the body of Christ right here, Victory Baptist Church, as you help one another to be formed into the image of Jesus Christ. Three things. Number one is we recognize the supreme authority that belongs to Jesus Christ. Did you see it there in verse number 18? Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now, if we really believe the Bible, that it is true, and that it is the Word of God, that is an incredible statement that Jesus Christ makes in verse number 18. When He says, all power, the word power has two primary meanings in the English language, and it's used in both ways in the Bible. Sometimes it speaks of ability and strength and might to accomplish a task. And when it speaks of the, the gospel, that's how it speaks of the gospel. It's the word dunamis. It's the word, uh, uh, it's, it's the word from which we get our word dynamite today. It's powerful. It has ability to do something. Here in this context, sometimes uh, we use the word to mean what it means here. And that is the connotation of authority. Power signifies authority. I was going to pull out my keys, but I gave them to my son to hold on to. I'm not sure if that was a wise decision. He's 14 and he wants to drive, but he doesn't have the authority to drive just because he has my keys, amen? He better not go out and take my car and try to go somewhere because he doesn't have a license to drive. So authority is that word which means that I have the, I have the right to claim to say this. I have the right to claim to do this. If you hold a title deed for a home, you hold a title deed for a vehicle, you, you have some other realm of, over which you exercise authority, it means that this is my property. This belongs to me. When you go home today to your house, you probably don't knock on the door first and ask if you can come in. You probably just go use your key, most likely, unlock the door and go inside. Why? Because this is my domain. This is my place of authority. I'm in charge here. I don't ask permission whether or not I can come in. When I go to get into my vehicle later, I'm going to ask my son for the keys, but not because I'm asking his permission to drive home, just because I asked him to hold them so they don't clank in my pocket, but that's my van, that's my place of authority, and I'm not like, oh, will you please give them to me? I hope he will honor my request. I, I think I know it belongs to me. We understand this principle of authority. Now Jesus is saying this, all authority is given unto me in heaven, and in earth. You know, Jesus Christ is the one who holds the preeminent place of authority. In all of heaven, there is no place in heaven that is off limits to Jesus Christ. 
There is no secret room in which he's not allowed because he is the king of heaven. It is his domain. There is no place on earth where he may not go, where he's not permitted entrance because even you say, well, I thought the devil had authority. Oh, yes, but you understand the devil's authority as the prince of the power of the air over this earth is, is authority that has been delegated to him. It's been loaned to him for a time. He's given space and, and measure to exercise whatever authority he has. But you do understand this morning, there's no competition. There's no question of who really holds the authority over the kingdoms of this earth. Because one day, the king of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ, he will destroy this heaven and this earth, and he'll make a new heaven and a new earth, and he will say, this is mine. The old one was mine, and the new one is mine, and I will do with it as I see fit. You see, the authority in all things belongs to Jesus Christ. Now, that question I asked you about who are you following this really becomes relevant at this point in time. Because if you think about it, that Jesus Christ, the Creator and the Savior, He is the one who holds the authority over all of heaven and all of earth, and that includes what you call your life and your existence. Jesus Christ holds the authority over you. Now he's given you the opportunity with the free will this morning to say I choose whether I will follow him or I choose whether I will go in my own ways. But make no mistake about it, your choice does not overthrow the authority of Jesus Christ. He's giving you time and space. He's giving you opportunity right now for a limited time to exercise your free will, but don't make any mistake about it. I hope you understand this morning, the Bible still says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know this morning as we think about this responsibility to help others to follow after Jesus Christ, it really ought to stir our hearts this morning that God of heaven... Jesus Christ, our Savior, is the only one who deserves the glory and the worship and the praise of man. And the glory of God is being defrauded today. As I speak this morning, it's defrauded by the works of darkness. The Bible talks about it in Romans chapter 1, how that men have suppressed the truth of God because they refuse to give Him the glory that he deserves. So when we think about our giving our life to help others to follow after Jesus Christ, Jesus, before he gives that instruction in verse number 18, he reminds his disciples, all power belongs to me. It would do us well this morning to renew our allegiance to the kingdom of Christ as the priority cause for our lives. Remember when Jesus said this in Matthew 6 and verse number 33? He said to his disciples, But seek ye first the kingdom of God. He said, Why did he say that to his disciples? Because he knew, <laughs> he knew that his disciples are so much like you and I, amen? Flesh and blood. He knew the temptation that they would have to be worried, and he talks about it in the context, to be worried about the things that they would wear. To be worried about the food that they would eat. I get worried about food. I used to think I was worried about food. I should stop picking on my son. He'll never want to travel with me again. But when I got a teenage son, I, I understood all over again what it means to be worried about food. You know, we're still shoving in the last morsel from lunch and he wants to know what the plan is for dinner. Amen. We get worried about this stuff. But you know, Jesus knows that... Uh, we need not be worried about all of the temporal things of life. We ought to be giving our attention to the eternal, to the kingdom of God. And so when we consider this truth, 
that all authority belongs to Christ. It ought to motivate us to involve our life so that others, not only that I would follow Christ, but that I would encourage others to follow Christ so that He would receive the glory from His creation that rightly belongs to Him. Number two, we see another reason that we ought to be involving our life to make followers of Jesus Christ. And that's very simply in verse number 19 because of the straightforward admonition that is issued by Christ. Look in verse number 19. Jesus says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. In other words, because I have all authority, because it is my rule, it is my domain, it is my right to tell you this, it is my right to send you forth, it's my right to command you as my servants. He says in verse number 19, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go. <laughs> you know, I'm not much of an English scholar, but the word go is a pretty simple word. It's a word that requires some action. You're not going to go and make followers of Jesus Christ by sitting at home and surfing the internet. That's probably not going to help you to fulfill this responsibility. I'm not preaching against surfing on the internet. Please don't take that the wrong way. But I am saying, if we're going to fulfill this commandment of Christ, we're going to have to get up from where we are, and we're going to have to go forth to where they are, and we're going to have to share the message of the gospel with them. And as we looked at in the Sunday school hour earlier, we're going to have to do more than share the gospel with them. We're going to have to invest our life to help them to make choices that they could be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. I hope you'll stay for the next hour after we take a break because I want to talk to you about some very practical things of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ and what exactly we're trying to impart to people when we say go and help them to follow after Christ. That's just a little plug for later. That was free. Amen. Now, back to the main thing. So Jesus says in verse 19, go ye therefore, and then here's the next word, and teach. That's a very interesting word. The word teach right here, it actually means, it, it is the same word that is used in verse number 16. In fact, look there at verse number 16. Because it's so different in the English language, I need you to look at it so that you'll get it, alright? You still with me? Say amen. amen. Verse number 16, then the eleven disciples, did you see it? That's the word, disciples is the very same word as in verse number 19 as the word teach. In verse 16, it's translated as disciples. In verse 19, it's translated as teach. You say, what are you talking about? Disciples and teach, those are two very different words. In the English language, yes. In the Greek language from which our English Bible is translated, they were the very same word. One of them was a noun and one of them was a verb. In verse number 16, the word disciples is a noun. Amen? I told you I'm not an English scholar. This isn't going to be an English crash course. But understand, follow with me for just a moment. We're not going to go too deep, okay? You know what a noun is, right? A person, a place, a thing, or an idea. Okay. So here, Jesus is referring to his disciples. They, as a noun, they are the followers those who followed after Christ. Okay, I can get that. Can you get that? Verse number 16, the word is disciples. It's a noun. Verse number 19, the word changes form to a verb form and it's translated into the English language as teach. And it literally means this, make disciples. Sometimes we use the word disciple like this. We talk about discipleship or we talk about discipling people. We're using it now in a verb form. We're talking about instructing and teaching and encouraging people to what? To follow after Jesus Christ. So here, here, get it now. A disciple in a noun, in the noun form is this. A disciple is one who follows Jesus 
Christ. A committed follower of Christ. That's what a disciple is. Now Jesus says to his disciples, those who are already following him, he says, I've got a job for you to do. I have all authority, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to go, and I want you to teach. I want you to go and make disciples. That's what Jesus is telling them to do. Don't just follow me yourself. I want you now, as a follower of mine, to get up from where you are and to go into the uttermost parts of the earth. And I want you to find others and make them to be disciples of me. That's what Jesus is saying. So there's a straightforward admonition. Christ is literally commanding us to go to all nations and to instruct them to become the followers of Christ. We must go and give the gospel, but then we must labor to instruct those who believe to observe all the things that Christ has commanded us to do. Now, this is an inconvenient truth. I say it's an inconvenient truth because we would prefer to discuss this in theory but we're rather reticent to actually embrace the personal responsibility of this in our own life. Because this now is a, an activity that is going to require sacrifice and personal involvement. I mean, being a disciple of Christ is sacrifice enough, amen? It means I'm not living for me, myself, and I anymore. My life is not my own. I hope that's your testimony this morning. If you're saved... You ought to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. There's no difference in the New Testament. Those who are saved are disciples of Christ. That's what it means to be saved. It means that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, as one who is following Christ, Jesus takes it to another level. He takes it to the next step and He says, Here is your marching orders. Here is your responsibility. Don't be content to say, okay, praise God I'm saved. Praise God I got the gospel. I'm so glad I got a good church to go to. I'm so sure glad I'm going to heaven when I die. Now Jesus says, it is now your obligation. It is your sacred honor and your duty to go to make other disciples. You know, in 1786, there was a man by the name of William Carey. He was a young man. He was not yet ordained. And he found out firsthand that this truth, if we're going to take the Scriptures literally, is a very inconvenient truth. He went to a preacher's meeting on a certain day as a young man, and he listened as these uh, greater men of the faith stood up and taught and preached and discussed and at the close of the meeting, one of the elder preachers in charge demanded that Mr. Carey and his friend should propose a question for general discussion. And so Carey, after they pressed and insisted, he, he suggested that they discuss this question. Whether the command that Christ gave to the apostles to go and teach all nations was not obligatory on succeeding ministers to the end of the world, seeing that the accompanying promise was of equal extent. Let me put that, paraphrase that into English for today. Kerry says, okay, this passage right here that I just read, he says, now Christ has made a promise that he will be with us to the end of the world. So because Christ promised His apostles that He would be with them to the end of the world, in other words, that promise had no end, amen, we would agree with that, then He says, what about that command that He gave those apostles to go into all the world and teach all nations the gospel? If the promise doesn't have an end, then the command doesn't have an end. That's what Carey proposed. Now, this was a radical idea in Carey's age. Churches of that day in England and other places, they did not see the personal need of involving as, as people of God to fulfill this great commission. They rather had the idea that 
As Dr. Ryland, the senior residing pastor, replied to Carrie's question, he said, Young man, sit down. When God is pleased to convert the heathen world, He will do it without your help or mine. <laughs> you know, Dr. Ryland, unfortunately, is not the only one who finds this truth to be inconvenient. We can talk about going into all the world and giving the gospel to every creature. We can preach good messages about being involved in giving our life, not, to, not just giving our money so that others can go and make disciples of Christ, but giving my life so that I can go and personally be involved in finding others, giving them the gospel, bringing them into a living relationship with Jesus Christ, and then helping them to grow up spiritually, to mature, to see their life changed. As the Scripture says in 1 Corinthians, from glory to glory, little by little, to, be, to, 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 to see them to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. You see, that's, that's what Jesus is talking about. This is the responsibility so there's a very straightforward admonition, but last of all, and I'll close with this thought, we see there's a sovereign appointment that has been declared by God. And for this, I want you to just quickly, you can lose your place here and just quickly turn to the book of Romans. We'll finish here in Romans. Romans chapter 8. Just look at this one last verse with me. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 29. <clears throat> Well, let's read verse 28 with it. Most of us know verse 28. We like verse 28. We always like to quote it to other people that are going through hard times and tell them, you know, be blessed. It's all going to work out for good. We don't like to remember it when we're in the trial ourselves. But anyway, we like it. We like verse 28. But I want you to read it with verse 29. It says in verse 28, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, some of you got nervous because I read the word predestinate. <laughs> and uh, don't worry, I'm not a Calvinist. Amen. But it, the word predestinate's in the Bible. I've never understood all the confusion about it because when you read it in plain English, it's very simple what it means. Very, very clear. And what a principle, what a Bible truth is here that if you and I will lay hold of this truth and allow it to affect and influence our life and our thinking, if we realize the fact that God has a sovereign appointment that has been declared by Himself to be true, He says, in verse number 29, that those that God foreknew, those, in other words, those that are saved, God already knew who would be saved. Don't get hung up on that. God knows everything, amen? God knows who's going to receive Him, and God knows who's going to reject Him. God doesn't have favorites. God doesn't choose some and reject others. No, there's some who choose God, and there's some who reject God. That's on us. That's not on God. So God foreknows this. God knows who belongs to Him. So He says He also did predestinate. That means to determine beforehand. God, so here, here's what the Bible's saying. God made a plan. God said, every one of my children, everyone who has believed on me, everyone who will be, here's what we're talking about, who will be a follower of Jesus Christ. I have a predetermined plan for them. I have a predestined arrangement with myself that every one of mine, I will not lose any of them. And when I call them to salvation, I have also called them at the same time to glorification. So he says, it is the plan and the purpose of God that those who are saved will be conformed to the image of His Son. You see, it is God's appointed purpose. He will conform His children into the image 
of Jesus Christ. The Bible says it like this in other places. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. It says this in Ephesians, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. The Bible says again in Philippians 3.21 that we will ultimately be made into His image, fashioned like His image, when we are glorified with Him in heaven. We could go on and on with other Bible verses that support this very same principle, but here's the truth. Get it this morning. God has a plan that those who belong to Him, those who are followers of Jesus Christ, you say, I want to know the will of God for my life. Well, here it is. The will of God is that you would be changed to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Can I tell you this morning, God has called us as a church. He's called you and given you the responsibility to go and make disciples. And that involves going and preaching the Gospel. And seeing people put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But it involves much more than that. It involves taking them as a new babe in Christ and helping them Imparting to them scriptural truth. Imparting to them your own walk with God. Helping them right now in the present tense, practically, in the day-to-day issues of life to be changed and conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. You see, God has a plan for your life. And it involves... To make you like Jesus Christ. Now I will ask you a question this morning. We'll close in prayer. What is it in your life today that is blurred? (laughs) When you think about the image of Christ and being like Christ, what what is the area of your life that maybe God would put His finger on this morning and say, um... That's not very much like my son. You know, the goal, the goal is to be like him. Let's pursue that goal this morning. Father, thank you.